Hello and welcome to Fire Headlines, where we cover the hottest topics in fire service news. I'm your host, Samantha Didion, and today I'm joined by the panel, Chief Jeff Buchanan. Chief Bob Horton is away this week. We also have a special guest joining us today to talk technology. Kevin Sofin, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please tell our audience a little bit about yourself and why you're so interested in technology in the public safety atmosphere? Thank you so much for having me here today. As you said, my name is Kevin Sofin. I spent 11 years at WS Darling Company, an amazing company that's making pumps and trucks and a range of equipment for first responders. And in that time, I worked with a range of different manufacturers, bringing new technologies to market from virtual reality training systems for um, training first responders, getting sets and reps on high risk, low frequency events to integrating different uh, robotic solutions to be able to get new situational awareness on on, uh, eyes on a fire to land robots, um, also doing different things with incident command software and biometrics. So had the fortune of being able to bring new technologies to market with Darley. And then through that time, started a community called smartfirefighting.com, building on the roadmap to the future of smart firefighting. And from that, we've created over 300, 400 podcasts and a bunch of roundtables and in-person events. And then around nine months ago, I actually have now kind of started my own company. I'm an independent. I'm, I'm now as a contractor to Darley, but also contracting with the International Association of Fire Chiefs, helping build out their Technology Summit International show, as well as working with a range of different startups and nonprofits across the public safety landscape and public health landscapes. And just very fortunate to be able to be in a position where I'm helping talk and bring tech to life. And I know I'm just a piece of the puzzle and I know technologists, entrepreneurs are just a piece of the puzzle, but um, I'm particularly fascinated in the entrepreneurs and the startup scene that's trying to find a way to work with public safety. And um, I've had the fortune of doing that now for 11 years and um, have stumbled upon amazing individuals like Jeff and uh, just excited to be here and learn more and find ways to continue to cast a spotlight on integrating tech into public safety. Awesome. Well, like I said, we're really happy to have you on the show because your insights are definitely going to help with our technology discussion. This week, we're looking at an article where the Denver police used reversed Google keyword search to track down an arson suspect. The Colorado Supreme Court ruled five to two that this keyword search can be admitted as evidence. So I want to ask you both this question, but I'll start with Jeff first. Jeff, how do you think this ruling will affect the overall process of gathering evidence in fire investigations? Great question, Samantha. First, great to see you again. Brother Kevin, great to see you, a fellow soccer fan in the house talking tech. It can't get any better than this. All right, let's dive in. Uh, I love this article. Uh, Where is it going to go? It remains to be seen. But what I love the start of this conversation is we're bringing in technology and we're going to get into this really robust conversation. I can't wait to hear what Kevin's perspectives are in this particular arena, but specific to this article, how's it going to change the landscape of investigation? Well, this is groundbreaking trailblazing information and a first time usage of this technology in order to do what they're calling kind of a reverse process, right? Usually they identify a suspect and then they gather information from identifying a suspect, where in this case, the article is so fascinating, it asked Google to run an address that had been used by anybody using Google in the world. And it came reverse back to these teenagers, which ultimately they were able to um, put the case together and, and, you know, and, and bring them to justice. So how is it going to change things? I think dramatically, I know that sounds so counterintuitive and, and maybe even lame, but that's the reality of it. It's going to add efficiencies and speed to justice. Unlike, unlike we've ever seen before. And what I, I love about it, you know, and some of the things, and, you know, again, Kevin's going to be able to speak really, really intelligently to this, you know, a lot of times at the Western, we talk about at the speed of tech, which is coming up today, 
if you're thinking about tech today, you're, you're too late because it's just moving. Everything is changing really millisecond to millisecond. And in the public safety space, it's no different. You have to leverage technology to its highest extent to make you the best agency that you possibly could be. And in this case, talking about the investigative side of things, using everything that's at your disposal. Now, what I thought was really interesting, particularly in this article, is that it really focused on Google. And why is that interesting? Because I, I mean, and Kevin, you might have some, some, some thoughts specific to this. There was an assumption that that's the only search engine that's out there. It tells you it tells you what the dominant search engine is, right? Google, because that's that's where the focus is. But the article doesn't allude to using, let's say, um, Microsoft Edge, Bing, or uh, Safari, or any of these others. And I wonder if that would have added a different dynamic to it. Just knowing a little bit, like let's say about Apple, would they have been so ready to to give in to law enforcement or able to use that technology? But I. I love the fact that this agency had the forward thinking to leverage technology. They had the vision to engage the legal system to really step out into a new space where they just had no idea where it was going to go. And to me, that's a small peek into what's around the corner everywhere. There's going to be all of these incidents where in the public safety space, we're going to have the opportunity to leverage technology and be bold and be in a place where we haven't been, but understanding and finding at least a great opportunity to, to try out these technologies. How is it going to help and how ultimately is it going to help the community? In this particular case, it brought um, it's a it's a it's a terrible terrible situation. Lives were lost, but justice was served, and technology was at the heart of it. So uh, I think it's going to make public agencies better, and it's going to make communities safer. And that's just the beginning of where technology is going to take us. And I guess to to add on to that, Jeff, I mean, when you when I read the article, frankly, I was I was kind of taken aback and surprised, and thought like, holy, holy smokes, this is the first time I've ever read or thought about how we could reverse engineer uh, with kind of, as opposed to, hey, we have a suspect, let's find data on it. It's more of like, actually, let's start uh, where we know the incident happened and sort of go from there. And I am a believer in we should be able to use, we should utilize all technologies available to help support first responders to do their job. Comma, this is a slippery slope. And when I saw, when I read this, I, I kind of thought about just Pandora's box. You can open up Pandora's box and a lot of good can come, but also a lot of bad can come. Um, and when thinking of that, I know when you're talking about any sort of uh, taking a step towards a civil liberty or or private land rights or data, like if you do it once, it's sort of if you give a massive cookie, then they're going to want the whole jar. And it's sort of a little bit of a slippery slope. But I, I do think it's for the better. And I think this is a unique example of where first responders are now starting to kind of toe the line in terms of the privacy rights, legal rights, and it's a good to line to toe where now just this conversation needs to happen more broadly. I know the article talked about how it's not a blanket that this can be used widely. It's sort of a case by case situation now, but I do also, it, it made me think about the integration of drones into to our lives where initially drones are coming up and they're like, Hey, you're looking at my backyard. And it's like, no, actually, the drone is, is starting here, and it, we're, we have a little doing some waypoints. And when it's traveling from spot A to point B, you know, it's not actually at this situation even recording anything. It's just moving. Um, and and I think as I've seen with drones, um, I was talking with Indiana Department of Homeland Security, Mike White, the other week. He talked about just by being out in the public and using drones and just talking with the community about what the drones are doing, how they're using them it started to kind of calm the fears of this privacy. Are you spying my backyard? And, and I think everyone's all for first responders doing their job better so they can indeed be safer. Um, so I think this is a very good opportunity to leverage tech to defeat the adverse adversary, whether that's fire or catching a bad person. Um, and it's just a matter we need that kind of walk the fine line with the legal side. And we need a lot of kind of normal, casual conversations between first responders in the community to show that, hey, this tech is available. Pandora's box is indeed 
opening and we need to leverage this to continue to make our communities as safe and resilient as possible. Kevin, I, I love that. I'm totally aligned with you. You know, it definitely gave the article gave some, hmm, how, how is this going to be received when you start talking about, you know, invasion of privacy in the broader context and, and ramifications of, of the technology. And it really is, it's, it's, it's really a fascinating conversation. Similarly, you know, you actually brought it up in some of the technology that you've been a part of. You know, you think about all of the advancements that are out there for specifically firefighter safety, monitoring of their of their health and safety, right? Heart rate, respirations, you know, even even more detail than that. Have you found any apprehension about even more personal technology like like that, for instance, geared towards helping firefighters, but maybe some firefighters being apprehensive about not wanting to share their personal health kind of condition, if you will, e even if it's being done for their benefit, maybe a little bit of apprehension. Have you found any like similar type situations where technology intended for good, but maybe some apprehensions because of other factors? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the biggest challenges that we face with integrating public technology into public safety. And I've heard Dr. Lori Moore and John Oates talk a lot about MFERS and now they move to, to Neris and just and, and just all the different personal health tracking accountability to be able to kind of track the amount of calls you've gone to over time and being able to use that to make claims on your, you know, if if you happen to develop some type of cancer or something in the future, that that data is there to be able to make sure that you can be taken care of based on the selfless work you've done as a first responder. Having said that, this process of inputting that data isn't automatic. It's kind of a pain. And so there's a movement to integrate new technology to automate where it's your first responder on this call, went to that call, all the reporting's done, you know, it's tracked in there and it's sort of mindless. And we're not quite there quite yet, but there's a lot of cool technologies being able to automate and streamline that kind of health data. But I think it is important about not, we're not trying to demonize or, or punish first responders for maybe not having perfect health or whatever they may be doing. Um, but this technology is meant to make you safer, make you stronger, make you more efficient. And, and I mean, a different example, but I'm seeing it firsthand, working very closely with Ascent Integrated Technology. Um, they're creating this new tech for indoor localization as well as biometrics. And I think there's been a lot of kind of snake oil smoke screens about indoor localization. But the NIST PSCR funded challenge administered by Indiana showed that this tech works. There were six companies in the finalists. They all had, some were using kind of LiDAR slam, some are using gate tracking, but like both these buckets of tech work for indoor localization. You layer on biometrics and we can now understand where the people are at, how they're doing and getting that information to incident commanders. I don't think either first responders, you know, firefighters in the fire or incident commanders outside are ever going to say that, hey, uh, understanding where I'm at, where I'm at and how I'm doing is a bad thing. It is, you know, as you could say, Jeff, I heard John Tippett say last night, the most the uh, empty feeling as an incident commander is knowing your people are in the building and not knowing where they are or how they're doing. Um, and so I think there's this evolution of tech where it's meant to help you, make you stronger, not meant to point a finger at you and say, you're, you're doing a bad job and we're going to punish you. Um, but that is a fine line. And I think we need to overcome those obstacles because it's, it's new, it's tech, it's evolving and it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not all flushed out yet. Hey, Kevin. So firefighters are creatures of habit and we love them for it, but how do you think that some integrating this kind of technology will, will work in maybe smaller departments? Do you see that as something that it'll take, you know, maybe years or so to get to? I mean, the this is an evolution, not a revolution. It needs to take time. And but I agree that right now, I mean, uh, I've mentioned Ascent Integrated Tech a few times, but yeah, they're rolling out with commercial departments um, in Southern Illinois, smaller departments, commercial customers. And um, I'll be keeping a very close eye on that. Um, smaller volunteer uh, mixed departments, you know, probably 10, 20 people or less. Um, so it'll be, it's happening, but I think the only way, and, and Jeff, this is sort of how we became friends. You, you got to break bread with first responders. You got to just sit at the table and talk shop. And, and I think some of the best things entrepreneurs can do is go to the fire department, um, you know, bring in donuts, bring in barbecue, you know, bring in coffee and just 
talk at the table, um, talk about sports, talk about fire, talk about whatever, um, but you'll be, a, and of course, I've heard the phrase of this when I was working with TSA, if you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport, kind of the same within the fire service, a lot of fire departments are different. So you need to talk to a hundred different fire departments um, to get an actual understanding of what's going on. And I think that is the only way it, it, we need first responders to feel like they're driving the solution that they're being heard because they know they need industry and first responders don't look at industry as like, screw you. You're trying to sell me something. It's like, no, they love industry, but you have to approach them in a way to be collaborative and not like, Hey, I'm going to sell you something that, you know, my company is going to go bankrupt in two years. And I don't really care because I'm just going to make money on you. Like there has been bad, bad actors that have done that in the past. And so I think it's obviously overcoming that and approaching the change management in the right way. What's the number one concern you've heard from firefighters when maybe doing some of these station visits? Um, I think biggest thing is that they just don't believe the tech works and that they, that mindset of hundred years of tradition unimpeded by progress. Um, you know, there's the great things about tradition, but there's also certain things where maybe there's tradition for a reason because they just are think the tech is going to either displace them. You know, I know, I know from Darley's perspective, when Darley brought compressor foam systems to the market, it was, Hey, you're making the truck and the fire suppression more efficient. Is that mean we're going to have less firefighters? And it's like, absolutely not. You know, the foam is a, as a tool that can be used to help you suppress certain fires and certain situations. And it's more of all of this tech is a force multiplier. It is a supplements you, it complements you. It doesn't, replace you um and so i think the biggest fear biggest challenge is just that tech is an enabler it's not a replacement for a firefighter or a first responder member in any capacity i think that that's super important kevin i love i love that point because there is a an uncertainty there is a and that uncertainty drives uneasiness from individuals who are worried about oh my gosh if i if we get this tech am i going to Am I going to lose my job? Am I somehow going to become irrelevant? And I, first of all, I love to eat and I feel like I'm good at it. And I couldn't agree with you more about breaking bread and, and creating that area of comfort. And sometimes I'm not advocating, but you know, maybe a bourbon or two will help as well. But the bottom line is giving people that, that zone of comfort and, and arming them with information. How is this technology going to help you and understand and demonstrate how this is about what you just said. This is going to make your life easier. And all of that time that you don't have right now for whatever those million things are, what technology is going to do for you is it's going to be a time creator. Because now all of a sudden, all this time that you had devoted on X now can be devoted on Y. I recently uh, was exposed to chat GPT. This is about six months ago by my brother, who is my best friend. And he's, long and short of it, the power of artificial intelligence. And then you tie that to all these other technologies that we're talking about, virtual reality, and how much better it's going to make us is, I, I mean, personally, I, you know, I don't have uh, uh, the level of expertise that you have with all this technology you've been exposed to. I'm a neophyte for sure, um, but I'm, I'm hungry for it. I, I love technology. I love where it's going and I'm, I'm, I'm just taking it all in, right? But I also know that being for the fire service, what we have to do equally as we acknowledge and identify tech that's going to make lives easier congruently and simultaneously, we have to prove to the first responders and the firefighters that are going to use it that, yes, it's going to make them better, but it's not going to it's not going to minimize you and how important you are to to the to the industry. And and so with that, what's your best kind of advice for fire leaders that are out there right now wanting to bring in tech, but know that they're, they have a, a, a potential obstacle with the adoption of technology because of the workforce, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to them, you, you know, in, in order to sell the hearts and the minds of, of those that could be using it? I think first is reminding everyone that the most important PPE on every first responder is still 
this thing in between your two ears, this, the human brain. This technology is meant to help not overload your cognitive aperture so you can focus on task at hand. That's just like, that's the ultimate goal of a lot of this new tech where it's wanting to create more time. I mean, it's sort of hard to think. It's like, what do you mean I could have an extra 30 minutes in a day, an hour in a day? But that's, that is ultimately how could we outsource and sort of streamline and automate some of these tasks? Um, but to approach an exchange management side, I mean, I think it's a matter of you have to start small. And I think there's groups like Western Fire Chiefs, you know, the I IFC and the Technology Council and this event that we're having on December 5th through 7th, the Technology Summit International. Um, it's it's a lot of forward minded, progressive thinkers about how do we Im implement tech in different ways. And I've been involved with integrating virtual reality training to community colleges around the country to a range of different fire departments, small, medium, large. Uh, I've seen drone adoption start initially. I was talking with a colleague last night, my my friend, Mike Masarino, who's now at DroneSense. He was showing drones at FDIC in 2010 and people basically laughed him out of the Lucas Oil Stadium. Um, now it's like every booth has a drone. Um, and so I think it's sort of that thing. Everyone thinks you're crazy and, until it's not. And, but you just, you just have to start somewhere. And, and that's why I exist in the, with Smart Firefighting Podcast. I mean, I interview technologists, entrepreneurs, different groups, and just how are we using tech? What is the problems it solve? What are the challenges you're facing? And I think the only way this is going to work is you have to, you have to do your homework. You have to spend a lot of time and you got to interact with, with guys like you, Jeff, and, and, and Kim Zagaris and Kirk McKenzie and Dan Muncie, like these are, and, you know, Kate Capallo, all these amazing people, David Blankenship, like I am, I'm a sponge whenever I'm with them and you're just hearing, it's not pie in the sky. It's like, this is a real example of how technology can be implemented. Oh, how could I do that in my department? You know, where do I start small and how do we help with the procurement? How do we help with building SOPs, small, medium, large, just to start with integrating drones, integrating VR, integrating stuff. Um, and so I'd love to be, you know, I want to continue to be a part of that. I think Western Fire Chiefs, IFC, um, have the platforms to do that because it, it can be very overwhelming when you're, again, you hear all this stuff. Sounds great. Where do you start? Um, but I would say, you know, start by reaching out to, to Jeff and Samantha, myself, um, other members, because that's why we exist. And um, I think we want to do a better job to help the change management part, because I think that's that's probably the biggest obstacle we face with integrating tech to public safety. And Kevin, if people do want to get a hold of you, can they find you on LinkedIn? Yeah, of course. Link, LinkedIn is is absolutely best. Um, Kevin Sofen, S-O-F-E-N, as well as check out smartfirefighting.com. We got, the, you know, or look at the Smart Firefighting podcast on Spotify and Apple. That's the best place to find me. And uh, we're just in the middle right now launching a 16 episode miniseries from the phase five first uh, challenge um, and had different entrepreneurs and, 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 and um, government stakeholders talking and we'll be at, I'll be at Technology Summit International if this airs before that, December 5th through 7th. Um, and if not, you know, just put it on the radar for next year. It's it's meant to be like an unconference, sort of a South by Southwest vibe for the fire technology environment. So um, that's that's my six now and um, just super grateful and excited to be part of this and look forward to continue to collaborate with all things uh Western Fire Chiefs Association. Yeah, thank you for joining us today, Kevin. And thank you for joining us, Jeff, as well. And to our listeners for tuning in, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And if you have a question for the panel, please reach out to us at fireheadlines at wfca.com and let us know what's on your mind. We'll see you back here next week for more Fire Headlines.